the history of the San Lorenzo Railroad project, because it was a project, it never succeeded, and so I'll give you that right out the front. It never succeeded, but the project was really groundbreaking in many important ways. So we'll go over those throughout this talk. The interesting thing about the railroad, though, is, is that if it had been built, it would have been the earliest railroad built in California, uh, outside the Central Valley, and it also would have been probably narrow gauge, which would have made it one of the earliest narrow gauge railroads built in California. So there's two separate things that this railroad was trying so hard to achieve, only to kind of fumble it and then completely fail. Just to give a couple railroad firsts for the area, uh, Sacramento Valley Railroad was the first railroad to actually operate in California in 1856. It was incorporated in, in 1852. That was a big thing, a deal, even though it didn't really go very far at first. It was just between uh, Sacramento and the gold fields. But it was still a good, uh, good start. From there, Congress in 1862 approved the uh, construction of a transcontinental railroad, but if any of you guys know the date, that's a, a bad time to be starting big mega projects across the U.S. So let's just say things got delayed a little bit. But one interesting fact is right at that same year, a letter to the editor of the Sentinel suggested that Santa Cruz should be the western terminus. And most people don't know, but Santa Cruz was actually one of the top ports in California in the 1860s. So it's not too crazy to think about. Even though we had pretty terrible anchorage for ships, it still was one of the top ports even then. And so it wasn't a completely crazy idea. Uh, the mountains are the main thing that kind of made it into a crazy idea. And so the very next year in 1863, a second railroad bill set the standard gauge at four foot, 8.5 inches. Seems like a little minor thing, but it actually does have a, a part to play in the story. Uh, it also allowed railroad companies to use eminent domain to acquire land for rights of way. And that is going to be extremely important as we go on. The last important uh, detail is in 1864, the San Francisco and San Jose Railroad was completed. And that one was, it went between the two cities and it eventually became the Southern Pacific Railroad. That became the main trunk of the Southern Pacific Railroad. And so, and literally the Southern Pacific started off as a subsidiary railroad of that one um, before the big four who owned the Central Pacific took over. So again, letter writer says Sentinel, they proposed, well, why don't we build from Santa Cruz up the San Lorenzo Valley to San Jose? And that was the real start of the story. So I have some of these photos littered throughout. Nothing too crazy. Uh, you may have seen some of these before, maybe not. This one was a train at Ar Arguello uh, near Redwood City, but just one of the San Francisco and San Jose trains. So in 1866, that's where the story actually really starts. Frederick Keene, who many of you have heard of in other studies and talks, I'm sure, big guy in the 1860s and 1870s of Santa Cruz County, he wrote to Sentinel proposing a railroad route up the Pajaro Valley to San Jose. This is where Hammond and I uh, split paths, you could say, because Hammond always assumed that Keene was one of the major proponents for the San Lorenzo Valley route, and he wasn't. He actually wanted the Pajaro Valley because it did make more logical sense. It's a lot more level to the Pajaro Valley. So he was really in favor of that. So Frederick Keene wrote the first letter to the editor, and the very next week, this guy named Cy, Cy Ante, spelled not quite Zyanti, but obviously referencing the same thing, he wrote in, I suspect this guy was another man called Thomas Selwy, Selly Farmer, uh, just because Farmer had come back uh, late in 1859, lived in Felton, had grown up in parts of Felton, so knew the San Lorenzo Valley pretty well. And later letters that he wrote seem to suggest that he's writing at about the same quality and detail. So it's a hunch, but that's what I'm going with. So Scienti said, no, we should go up the San Lorenzo Valley to Redwood City. Super important. I, we think we can do this. Keen said, no, I think that's too difficult, but show me your numbers. So Scienti provided them so many numbers. It's two full columns in the newspaper, so many details, and it's great. And it tells us a lot because all the maps of this proposed route have been lost. So his description, as well as a couple other descriptions there in the papers, are really all we have for where this route exactly was supposed to go. 
but he he certainly thought it was feasible. And so other people did too. And within the next year, a whole bunch of public meetings were held in, across the county, mostly in Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And they all just talked about this. The more letters the editor appeared. It became a huge topic of conversation. I'd say about every, at least once a month, there was a letter to the editor about this uh, subject. And so just to give you some context, in 1863, so just a couple years before this, this is a sketch of what Zayanti Rancho looked like. So it was, Felton was not a very well-developed area at the time. So we'll move on. And that will come into play also uh, in a moment. So why build a railroad? Really anywhere in the county, but specifically why build one up the San Lorenzo Valley? Again, we don't think today San Lorenzo Valley is a huge industrial center. If we think of anything, it's lumber. And lumber was obviously the big thing. But it wasn't just redwood. They used fir. They used oak. They used madrone. They used pretty much every single tree you could find in the forest could be turned into something. In fact, we wouldn't have nearly as much poison oak and blackberry that we do today if they had left all the trees because a lot of these trees produce a quite acidic soil which doesn't allow undergrowth. So that's why when you go into places like Henry Cowell uh, Redwoods, you don't see a whole lot of brush under the ground because the redwoods are keeping it at bay. And so you've got things, industrial resources like redwood and other timber products. You've got tan bark for tanning oils. You have leather products. You have blasting and gunpowder because the California Powder Works, which were at the Paradise Park, had opened up by this point in time. Uh, limestone was a huge industry. It wasn't just the uh, Henry Cow Company that did limestone. There was limestone all up uh, in the Felton area too. Bull Creek up above uh, downtown had multiple quarries there. And they also just had concrete grade sand. Uh, if you've ever been to uh, the Quail Hollow Ranch area, they have uh, remains of some quarries there, lots of sand. Uh, there was a paper mill that was next to Paradise Park. And then there's just the general ones, meat, dairy, agricultural products. There's a lot of stuff. And this is mostly growing in the San Lorenzo Valley or in downtown Santa Cruz. So it could be really benefit from a train. And then there's the usual commuters, vacationers, and then just a general concept of connecting to the Bay Area. So the solution was, we're going to make a railroad. And what's interesting is two railroads were formed within a few days of each other. In, on June 20th, 1867, that's when the San Lorenzo Railroad was incorporated. Two days later, another railroad called the California Coast Railroad was incorporated by Heen. And that one's goal was to connect San Jose to Watsonville. So these came out at the same time. They had completely different backers. I don't think there's any overlap in their articles of incorporation. They're very different. So San Lorenzo Railroad wasn't going to go straight to San Jose or Redwood City on its first, at, on its first project. It wanted to just go 15 miles to Kings Creek. Now you have to remember at this time, Felton doesn't exist yet, Ben Lomond doesn't exist yet, Boulder Creek doesn't exist yet. So the San Lorenzo Valley, it's just a bunch of rural farmers and timber crews and a couple people still left over from a gold rush in Felton. So 15 miles is going to get you to the bottom of Kings Creek, mostly. It's a, it's a rough estimate. And they thought $150,000 would do it at the time. Uh, they were wrong with the amount of money. They were wrong with their vision of where they're going. But you have to work with what you got at the time. So they started surveying right away. Oh, I should talk about some of the board of directors. So some of the board of directors, if you're from Felton or lived in Felton before, you'll recognize some names. Horace Gushy was the first president. He was a real estate broker for, eventually, uh, Isaac Graham's estate. Uh, a, a medical doctor, William F. Peabody, was the president for most of the existence of the company. Samuel A. Bartlett was the treasurer. I have to say, I don't know a whole lot about Bartlett, unfortunately. Uh, Joseph Boston was briefly the treasurer, and he was well known for several industries, including real estate, tanning, and being a, a general store merchant. Edmund Jones, one of his close relatives, was also in the tanning business as one of Boston's partners. And Edward Williams was the secretary throughout most of the history of the company. And he was a, another merchant and a notary public. So most of these people had business interests in the Santa Cruz or San Lorenzo Valley uh, industries. 
So returning to the main story. So surveying started in August 1867. Grading, as it often does, took a little bit longer because they had to get some money. So that started in May. And they had about two good months of grading. And from all reports that I can find in the newspaper, it was a good two months. They got a long way, or a lot done in those two months. And I'll tell you why in a second, why that's why, when it stopped. Uh, Felton, though, was incorporated during this construction. So in the summer of 1869, Felton was officially laid out as serving as the northern terminus of the first section of the San Lorenzo Railroad. So Felton exists officially because the railroad was supposed to stop there. So that's something to keep in mind. Felt, Felton exists because of something that never happened. <laughs> So this is a rough estimate of the route that was talked about. Um, it follows mostly the route of the current uh, Big Trees Railroad until you get to the bridge in Felton, the one across the San Lorenzo River. It followed the river more closely. It was further down grade than the actual uh, route that we have today. And you can see that little diversion around what we call the Hogsback. So just to the north of Paradise Park. So that the original route was gonna go right around the hogs back, which added an extra 1.2 miles to the route. So you can be, you can see that that tunnel that they have proposed in there, that big uh, red line, that was something they were really excited about when they discovered, hey, we could just tunnel through this because <laughs> it also saved them from two uh, bridges that they needed. So the original plan, it's one of the two original plans was to go right through Paradise Park, which at the time was the California Powder Works. For safety reasons, it seems likely they would have actually graded on the other side had they ever gotten there. So just to avoid going through the middle of the, uh, the active powder field, let's just say sparks from railroads and don't always go well with black powder. This is what Santa Cruz looks like uh, in 1873. So this is actually after the railroad project failed, but before the actual railroads were built. So you can see Neary Lagoon there. You can see some orchards. You can see how there's not really a huge cut where Pacific Avenue is today because that cut was actually built by the Santa Cruz and Felton Railroad in 1875. And we have two piers at this time, or wharf. We have the Cal Wharf on the left and the Main Street Powder Works Wharf on the right. And that, oh, and that main road that you can see, that's Laurel Street. Here's what downtown looked like. It's just a little dusty town. This is one of the earliest photographs we actually have of Santa Cruz. And that flat iron building right in the middle was Frederick Keene's offices upstairs. This is the paper mill. So this is when you're on Highway 9 going towards Felton and you see where the Paradise Park turnoff is and there's that little entry kiosk. This is where this is. Okay, and then here's the powder works itself. Thriving place. Obviously a, a sketch rather than the actual photograph. Um, but... It was a large facility, so you can see why the railroad would definitely be keen to go through there, or at least be able to access it, because the, the powder works definitely wanted to ship stuff via rail if they could. It's much more efficient. It's just a nice little scenic picture on the river. Again, so you can see that how flat the river is here. So the railroad was planned to be built just above the flood line, the, the high, yeah, the high water line. And so it would have probably been on just above the landing here. This sketch is one that's always kind of made historians scratch their heads a bit because this doesn't actually, this is Highway 9, well, what became Highway 9. This is the old toll road, but nobody's quite sure exactly where it's portraying because it seems almost to show the wagons on the route that the railroad later followed. So it's a little bit confusing, but it still gives you a good idea of how cavernous and tree covered the area was but also how steep that the San Lorenzo Gorge can be at times. And this is just to show you the uh, predicted route. Uh, this is based more on the route that the flume eventually took because a later note, it was done in the 1820, or in 1920s, the note, but the San Lorenzo Valley flume apparently followed a lot of the course of the, of the surveyed route to Kings Creek. So this is a rough estimation of where that route went so this is presumably where the San Lorenzo Railroad route would have gone to. So Felton's on the left and Boulder Creek's mostly on the right with Kings Creek at the very uh, top or the, <laughs> the northernmost point on the right. And so you can see Highway 9 on there too. So it, 
they only crossed paths really in Ben Lomond, which is where the railroad later would also cross paths with the main highway. So, yep, and then that's just some forest land uh, in the vicinity. It's a little bit further south of Kings Creek, but it's the best I could find for the area. It's one of the earliest photos we have of the Boulder Creek area. So I said that the railroad stopped, or they stopped constructing in July 1868, and that's because of these two fellows here. This is Isaac Davis and Henry Cow. You've all heard of Henry Cow. Isaac Davis was the senior partner in the company at the time, which was called uh, Davis and Cowell or Davis and Cowell Lime Company. In 1866, uh, 1868, they filed an injunction against the San Lorenzo Railroad because the railroad was u following the law. The law said a railroad can seek a right of way through private property as long as it's for the public good. And a railroad, by definition, is usually for the public good. So this is supposed to be a public common carrier conveyance, and it was supposed to go right through their property. Problem is, Davis and Cal had a lot of reasons they didn't want that to go through there. The number one reason, they shipped lime. They were a lime, almost a lime monopoly on the west coast of California at the time, and a lot of their rivals were in Felton. Well, if they could stop the rivals in Felton from affordably shipping their lime, that was great. So let's stop them. The bulk of Henry Cal Redwood State Park today is the Davis and Cal property. The only, the only part that's not actually their property was the Little Welch Grove, which is the Redwood Loop. So all of that land was originally Rancho Cañada del Rincón in El Rio San Lorenzo. That was a land grant from 1843. The original grant was over 8,000 acres. It was given to Pedro Sansevén, a formerly French citizen. And he started building mills early on in the 1840s. In 1858, it was confirmed to him by the U.S. government, although quite a bit smaller than the original grant. And the next year, in 59, he deeded the property to Isaac Davis and his partner at the time, Albion Jordan, to use for the lime company. Over the next couple years, uh, Davis and Jordan sold parts of the property to the powder mill. They sold it to the paper mill. Sorry, pow powder works in the paper mill. And the remainder of the property remained theirs. The number one thing they used the, the timber for was firewood. Kilns take a lot of wood, and so it was for firewood, which is really sad to think about. So most of the, uh, most of the wood that was in the Sandlands of uh, Gorge at the time was not being used. But that didn't mean they weren't planning to use it at some point, and that was their main excuse, is technically speaking, besides being able to condemn land without permission, and without compensation, they also were allowed to cut down trees and take those and use them for railroad ties or whatever they needed. And Davis and Cal, for all those reasons, said no and sued them. And so construction stopped, and most importantly, the workers were sent home. San Lorenzo Railroad still was not super well funded at this time, and that was a really important problem because they couldn't afford both funding their workers and funding their lawyer and so they had to side with the lawyer in this so they got the lawyer and fortunately for them in august the injunction was dismissed uh they had to release a ten thousand dollar bond which is a lot of money especially for this company that was poorly funded but it was already close to the end of the season it was far enough along that they decided not to hire new crews to work for another month just to not finish the job so things went on pause at the end of 1868 so this is just a, this is one of the early government sketches of uh, Rancho Rincon. It's very hard to tell. So Zianti Creek is at the right, that area that's not shaded, but still kind of boxed in. That's uh, Rancho Zianti. So you can see it's a very crude map. Santa Cruz is to the left. So again, the north is to the right. This is an older map. This is from the A.J. Hatch map from 1889. But you can see right in the middle there, the Davis and Cal land. It's pretty much all of it. You can see the Rancho de la Cañada del Rincón. So you can see that's a big obstacle in the way of the railroad. So Davis and Cal were not going to take getting their case dismissed sitting down, so they appealed it to the state Supreme Court. Uh, the state Supreme Court didn't side with them, but did let them hold the injunction. So the railroad was once again stopped from being able to build. It was one of the weirdest things because everyone except Davis and Cal seemed to want this railroad. Not a single letter against the railroad. 
came up in the newspapers, everyone was in favor. So Davis and Cal were very much the bad guys in this, and several of the letters to the editor said as much. But it didn't matter. Uh, in April 1869, so we're already starting to get into the next year, Supreme Court once again ruled in favor of the railroad. But by this point, they were just exhausted from money. They had nothing to afford workers, nothing to afford further grading. It seems that about two miles were graded south from Felton, including through some of Cal's land, but it's really unclear how much actually was graded by this point. And it's also slightly unclear if they ever resumed grading. There's a, one single article that hints that they had restarted, restarted, but it doesn't actually say it explicitly. So this is where this experimental research comes in. You're not always sure what's going on. And so finally, the railroad desperate, in June 1869, they sued Davis and Cal for damages and lost revenues. It's what any person would do, I feel like, if they could afford it. And so they were very optimistic, though. They said, by spring 1871, we're going to do a funding drive. There's a new state subsidy that Frederick Keene's trying to pass. He'd just been elected to state senator, I mean, state, uh, state assemblyman. They're very optimistic that they're going to be able to start in 1871, especially if they won this lawsuit and got some more money. This is where our friend Heen comes in. I said he'd be back. So Heen had changed his position in late 1869 because he wanted people to vote for him. And there was a lot of people in the northern side of the county that wanted the San Lorenzo Railroad. And so he decided, okay, I guess I will support that. So his entire platform, or the, well, the main thing of his platform for running for state assembly is he was going to build three railroads. So one up to Pajaro Valley to Gilroy, one up to San Lorenzo Valley, and another one up SoCal Creek, which that one he eventually had to drop because everyone saw it for what it was, which was him trying to make money off of his own lands. <laughs> and the problem was his bill got vetoed by the governor. The governor was against special subsidies, and it got vetoed. So in 1870, all of a sudden the money dropped out again. So without money, railroad was still stalled, by this point, Davis and Cal had once again appealed for a second trial. So that was going on. So the lawyers were still being used to try to win more money. They were still trying to use to defend the case. Things were getting very complicated. <laughs> and so he did the thing he sometimes did, which he made everything worse. <laughs> so there was this new technology. I said it was going to come back. Called the Narrow Gauge Railroad. It hadn't really been tested much on the West Coast, but it was cheaper and a survey from Heen had proven that the curves of the San Lorenzo Railroad were probably going to be unreasonably sharp and tight for being able to run a railroad up San Lorenzo Gorge. But a narrow gauge railroad could pull it off. And so he decided rather boldly within the last month of his term as assemblyman to incorporate his own railroad called the San Lorenzo Valley Railroad. These two often get conflated, but they are completely a separate companies. And except for, oddly enough, they shared a secretary. So, and we don't have the list of all of the backers. So I think there was a little coordination going on, but it's really unclear how it's coordinated. He is never listed as a, as a sponsor of the San Lorenzo Railroad. And most of the board is never on the uh, sponsor list for the San Lorenzo Valley Railroad. So only a light overlap. But I suspect they did support it because what Keen wanted to do was turn it into a narrow gauge railroad, recapitalize it at $200,000. He got a whole bunch of popular people. George Treat owned a huge mill in Southern Felton, kind of in the vicinity of the Toll House Resort. Uh, R.C. Kirby. Kirby was uh, another leather guy, and he was also one of Boston's co colleagues. So again, some crossover going on with these people. And then Mountain Charlie McKiernan, who ran the toll road uh, over the mountains. By this point, the toll road, I don't think, was a toll road anymore. And so he was looking for a little extra money, and he also did a lot of lumber on his own property. So got strong financial support from some wealthy people. So they started all over. They started surveying again in March. Uh, and this is the second cool thing. I discovered in January 1872, Boulder Creek was... It wasn't named Boulder Creek yet, but it was pretty much founded to be the northern terminus of the second section of the San Lorenzo Valley Railroad. 
So San Lorenzo Railroad's first section was going to terminate in Felton, which was incorporated for that, or created for that. Boulder Creek, same way. At the time, it was called Alcorn's because John Alcorn owned the property. So surveying began. Boulder Creek was cleared uh, to act as a terminus, and everything fell apart once again. And so this is where we're going to end our story, sadly, is Davis and Cal, I said, they were granted a rehearing. It took three years for that rehearing to happen. And in that time, they still wouldn't let the San Lorenzo Valley Railroad go through their land either. Again, competition. So it just disappeared. After one year of fervent talk in the newspapers, San Lorenzo Valley Railroad vanishes. But the San Lorenzo Railroad, the original one, does persist because of the court case but at this point they hadn't worked on the railroad for years and they had no money the only money they had was presumably for lawyers and so the the landmark case was finally decided on february 21st 1874 davis and cow won the case and it set a new legal precedent that lasted for the next five years until it was incorporated into the new constitution in 1879 and it said what's still on the books today Nobody can go into your land and steal your land for public use without consulting with you, without compensating you properly. And if they use anything on your land, such as timber or, well, yeah, timber or any other resource, they need to also compensate you for that and probably ask your permission. So it's the basis of today's eminent domain laws. And this happened because Davis and Cal didn't want a railroad to go through its property to make it so its competitors had access to shipping. And the natural result of that was the San Lorenzo Railroad dropped its countersuit and the company disappeared. It just, by the, after April, you never hear from it again. Uh, at the end of that year, though, there's a little bright light. The, in November 9th, 1874, the Santa Cruz and Fountain Railroad was incorporated. It was incorporated as a narrow gauge line. They worked with Cal and Davis to actually get it pa get it built. They gave them some concessions, made sure they followed all the new laws that were on the books. And so that really worked in Cal and Davis's favor, even though their competitors did now have access to shipping out uh, from the port of Santa Cruz. And then six years later, the South Pacific Coast Railroad was built and that then connected the valley on both sides and Cal was no longer much of a problem by that point. Uh, but one lasting little legacy is in newspapers, when you're looking in newspapers, up until the 1910s, really until World War I, but even a little bit after, you still have this dream that the San Lorenzo Valley was somehow going to eventually connect on the northern end. There was a railroad that went all the way to the headwaters of the San Lorenzo Valley or River, uh, right below Castle Rock. It's within Castle Rock State Park. But they, they would have had to build a tunnel, and they never did. There's some talk about going up Kings Creek Road since it was an easier gradient, but they never did that either. And so we never, San Luis Valley had plenty of railroads, but they never went out of the valley except via Glen, uh, Glenwood and several tunnels uh, to Los Gatos Creek. So they never went up to the top of the valley. So Boulder Creek was never on the main line or anything like that. And yeah, that's where my story ends for today.